Good morning, everybody. I'm Bart Stever, Senior Minister at Parkside, and glad to welcome anyone who happens to be here new as a guest with us for the first time this morning. I was so taken by the communion time and the beautiful music <laughs> this morning. Did we take the offering? Is there? Okay, good. We got, we got that covered. All right. Um, just checking, making sure. I want to add my uh, words of thanks and appreciation to our veterans on this, the official Veterans Day. And you got to see some of our veterans in the video there, and I know there are others here who are serving or have served, or you have family members who have served in the military, and so grateful for that, so appreciative and so humbled by people who are willing to put their lives on hold and put their lives on the line uh, for the sake of others. Uh, freedom isn't free. There's a cost to it, and our veterans are people who are willing to pay that price, and so we're very, very appreciative of you. Thank you so much. The ICOM is coming to town. The International Conference on Missions starts Thursday night. Of course, the party starts here Wednesday night, but uh, Thursday, and if you have not registered for that, I encourage you to do that. Go to theicom.org, and you can pick up one of the hard copies of the e-letter. It's out in the lobby this morning, and it tells you exactly how you can do that. It will cost you nothing. Um, we've already paid for the pre-registration for that. And that will bring home this understanding of our, our world in the way that God sees it. You know, our slogan or our motto for these last few weeks has been, this is my world because it's, it's my world that I live in. But it's actually God's world, isn't it? And he lets us live here. He's given us this beautiful home. But the world is more than just the entire creation. The, the world that God loves is people. So we are wanting to understand who God loves and how God loves and to capture his heart and make that our heart to love the same people that God loves. Actually, that's, that's uh, not an exclusive club at all. There's nobody excluded from, there, from that uh, gathering of people. And then to do that in the way that he does, in the wonderful, loving, sacrificial way that he does. And we want to focus on some particular people this morning that God loves. You may have siblings. I have two siblings, a brother and a sister. What would it take, if you have a brother or had a brother, what would it take for your brother to convince you that he's the son of God? What would he have to do to make you believe that? Well, that was the situation with Jesus and his siblings. Jesus had four brothers. Their names are recorded for us in the, in the history of his life. He had some sisters as well. And they had a dilemma because for 30 years, Jesus had been there at home living with the family. He's out building houses, and one day he drops the hammer leaves the, the construction business and goes off into the wilderness, is baptized in the Jordan River, and claims that he is the Savior of the world and God's Messiah. What in the world do you do with that when your brother makes that kind of a claim? And his brothers and sisters at first didn't believe him. They uh, thought he was out of his mind, that he was beside himself is one of the polite ways that it's put there in the history. They thought he was off his rocker. They even tried to get him to come back home one day. They went out and said, we need to bring him back home. This is getting out of hand. Jesus, you need to come home and take some meds. And really, you'll, you'll be fine when you get over this Messiah thing. But that changed. Finally, at least for one of his brothers, his brother by the name of James, who became a complete and total, all-in, full-on follower of his brother as his Lord, his Savior, his Creator, as his God. He accepted the fact that his brother Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Now, what was it that finally put him on the other side of the ledger from saying, yeah, I've got a brother named Jesus, and he's nuts, to bowing down and worshiping him? 
What made the change? It was the resurrection. A man named Paul tells us that there were over 500 people who saw Jesus alive after they knew that he had died through Roman crucifixion. And it, he, Paul lists who these people were that saw Jesus alive after he died. And one of them that he points out specifically is James, his brother James. And James rose to prominence there in the city of Jerusalem. He became an elder, a leader in the church. And later on, he wrote a letter to Christians, words of encouragement. You can look it up in the back part of your Bible. It's called James. If I ever write a book, I'm going to call it Bart. Just kind of says it all. Very practical teachings that he offers there. And you know that in this letter that he wrote, he is speaking the heart and mind of his brother Jesus, his Savior Jesus. He probably heard Jesus say many of these things, even though at the time he wasn't a believer. But then afterwards, he also interacted with the ones who had been with Jesus for three years. So he was very aware of the heart of his brother and the heart of God and what it means to love people in a practical way and who we should love. And here's what he says. James says, if you want to step into the heart of God and love the people that God loves, here, here are two groups of very important people. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, certainly there, there's, there are additional concerns that we have in following Jesus. But James says these two rise to a, a very high level, these two groups of people, widows and orphans. When you look uh, through the entire document that we call the Bible, this record of God's interactions with us, you see throughout, in the older books, in the back half of the Bible, and then in the newer books, in the front half of the Bible, toward the end, widows and orphans are constantly referred to as being people that God loves and that He expects us to, to care for because they're very vulnerable. They need somebody to look out for them. God uses the treatment of widows and orphans as a barometer as to how good our hearts are and how faithful we are to understanding His heart, whether we really are serious about being godly people or not. He said that the barometer that I use is, one of them that I use is, how do you treat widows and orphans? You look in a, in a study Bible, you look up in the back, a, a, a word, and you can see what's referred to throughout the Bible. You look up widows and orphans, and you'll find tens, twenties, I don't know, maybe hundreds, I don't know, many, many references to God's concern for widows and orphans. In Psalm 68, it says that God is a father to the fatherless, the fatherless, orphans, and he is a defender of widows. Is God in his holy dwelling? God sets the lonely in families. Widows figured prominently in the ministry of Jesus. I suppose in his day, the mortality rate of men was fairly high. And so there may have been more widows percentage-wise than what we have today. I, I really don't know. But he came across many widows during his ministry and interacted with them and helped them and loved them and even used them as illustrations, as heroes in some of his stories. And, of course, included in this would be men as well, men who have lost their spouses. And the care of widows was very prominent in the beginning of the church. Um, from almost day one, as they were distributing food and taking care of people in the church there in Jerusalem, they found that some of the widows, one group of widows, was being left out of, of the food distribution. And so they immediately addressed that and made sure that all of the widows were taken care of. And so it's a, it's a priority. And hopefully those of you who are widows and widowers who are here at Parkside, hopefully you feel cared for, that you have a family here at Parkside. And perhaps, I mean, I, I haven't lost a spouse. I don't know what that's like, but 
to have this person that's been in your life for so many years and to suddenly for that to be gone, the, the sense of emptiness that would come with that and the loneliness that would come with that would be just, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to suddenly not have Marilyn in my life. And so, if you are a widow or a widower here at Parkside, if you are not sensing family among us, that we are your family, if we're not paying sufficient attention to you, caring for your needs, addressing your loneliness, tell us, okay? Sometimes you got to tell us, and we'll do better because it's important. We need to look around and see there are some people in that lonely situation who don't have any family beyond the spouse that they lost, and we're coming into a significant holiday time. Wouldn't it be an awful thing if they didn't have any place to go for a Thanksgiving dinner or a holiday celebration? And we need to put those people on our radar and make sure that everybody's got a place to go on the day that we give thanks to God, especially. And tomorrow, tomorrow evening at 6.30, there's going to be a special gathering here at Parkside for those who are they will be struggling with the holidays because of that loneliness, because they've lost, maybe it's a spouse, maybe you've just lost somebody very significant in your life, and you're going, oh, wow, this is going to be hard. Thanksgiving, Christmas, without this person, ugh. Well, there's a gathering of people here who understand that. Tomorrow night, 6.30, and they can come around you like uh, just a very soft hug and help you with some of that. So we invite you back for that tomorrow evening. So God has a heart for widows, widowers, and he has a heart for orphans, the fatherless, another group of very vulnerable people. Now, Jesus didn't uh, use the word orphan as uh, he spoke of, of, of children, as he even interacted with children. Uh, he did talk about orphans. He talked to us, and he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, talking to us when he was getting ready to ascend to the Father and the disciples were getting all concerned. He said, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you fatherless. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. The Holy Spirit is going to come to you, and you're going to have the Father within you like you've never been up close and personal with the Father before. He'll be right here in your heart, in your life, your mind, your soul. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Certainly, Jesus loved all children, and orphans would have been a part of that. Amazingly, he brought children front and center into his ministry, which wouldn't have been typical in that day and time. In the culture in which he lived, you just wouldn't have prioritized children. You waited until they became adults, and then they had some value in the society. But Jesus said, no, children have tremendous value. There were mothers who were bringing their children to Jesus for prayer and for a blessing, and the disciples tried to shoo them away because Jesus was too important to deal with kids. You know, they'd get his robe all sticky or something, and so they were trying to shoo him away. And uh, Jesus said, no, you, you bring the children here because this is a, a model for our faith. Kids are so innocent, so prone to believe, so prone to love, so distant from evil in their minds and their hearts. This is what we need to become, more like these children. And he, he gathered them up, blessed them, prayed for them. And he said, you know, if, if anyone causes one of these little ones who is prone, who finds it so easy to believe in me, if anybody would wreck the faith of a small child, wow, that's serious business. God does not take that lightly. God, there are harsh things in store for people who don't regard the heart of God for children. God expects us to care, especially for vulnerable children. And there are a lot of vulnerable children because the fatherless, those who have no father, who have no father or mother, those who don't have any kind of a stable home to live in are some of the most vulnerable among us. This is the International Day of Prayer for orphans. Worldwide, the church is praying that kids who are at risk, at tremendous risk, and, and in harm's way 
because they've got nobody to protect them, nobody watching over them, no place to call home. This is the day that the church is not only praying for those kids and praying for that issue, but also moving to do something about it. November is National Adoption Awareness Month. November the 17th is coming Saturday is National Adoption Day, and there's a, a great emphasis within our culture for people to regard the kids who are in foster care who will be uh, candidates for adoption. And there are already a lot of kids now, even in Hamilton County, who are foster kids waiting to be adopted. And that can happen immediately. And it doesn't even cost anything. You know, adoption can cost a lot of money. These kids in the foster system who have been released, all parental rights have been released and are ready to be adopted, it doesn't cost anything to do that. But many of these kids are older, and older foster kids oftentimes usually come with issues, stuff going on in their lives that's not easy. And so they're not as readily adopted as other kids are. But National Adoption Day places an emphasis on that, and there are a lot of families that come forward and seal their adoption, make it official and legal on this coming Saturday, who will do that. I won't ask for a show of hands here this morning, but we have uh, people in our family here, Parkside, who are adopted. Maybe you're an adopted person, and you know what that has meant in your life to have a family that you wouldn't have had otherwise. We have uh, families who have adopted children into their home, into their hearts and their family, and we have a, a significant number of fostering families here. That's becoming more and more uh, a trademark of Parkside. What a wonderful trademark uh, to carry, to care about these kids that God cares so much about. We have mission partners that we support who are taking care of orphan kids. Waves of Mercy, this is Larry and Diana Owen. They're in Haiti, and they're in the town of port au -Pay. There are these kids known as street boys. They have aged out of any kind of orphanage help, and so they are on their own. They are surviving however they can do it. And so Larry and Diana have pulled these street boys in to take care of them within their mission. In Kyrgyzstan, we support an effort called Jeremiah House. Ruby and Lynn Johnston bring these boys into Jeremiah House. Again, they've aged out of any kind of system that can care for them in, in orphanages. And they're on their own. They're vulnerable out on the streets. And so they can come to this place and it's home. And they can be loved and protected and cared for. The most important thing that happens is they learn of the love of Christ, but they're also taught a trade and have a means of, of survival and a quality life as they mature. So both of these mission partners will be with us next Sunday. But we also have uh, efforts going on right here in Parkside to care for foster children in Hamilton County, in the city right around us. So many opportunities that we can step into to have God's heart for these kids and to do something about the risk that they face. Because especially when, when kids reach a point where they, as we say, they age out of the system to where they... they can't even be fostered anymore. They can't be in some kind of a residence anymore because they're 18 and they've got no place to go. And where these kids end up, this isn't just a worldwide problem. This isn't a third world problem. This is a Hamilton County problem. Kids end up in, in addictions. They end up being trafficked into uh, prostitution or slave labor. They end up in prison or they end up dead. Terribly at risk. And so we have the opportunity as the church, as hearers and doers of the word, and, and those who understand God's heart for the most vulnerable, we have the opportunity to do something about that. We want to show you a video of some of our Parkside families and what they have to say about kids and foster care and adoption. My name is Christy Sadler, and I work with the Family Nurturing Center. The mission of our agency is to end the cycle of child abuse. In the visitation program, we work with families whose children are in foster care. And there is a tremendous need in Hamilton County for families who are willing to step up and foster those children who 
need a place to be safe and loved for a short amount of time and potentially a long amount of time. I have found that it's really important for us to find families who understand the importance of loving a child and the family where they are. The goal typically is reunification of the children with their families. It is a really difficult thing to bring a child into your home, love them with all your being, and know that you may give them back. But that is a really critical piece of being a foster parent. The goal is not typically adoption. And I also see that our older children are greatly in need of homes. It's much more difficult to bring an older child into your home than a baby. I think the biggest need in the Cincinnati foster care system is people, and specifically people who love Jesus and are willing to step into a, a system that is founded on brokenness, that is founded on, on things not going the way that they're supposed to go. And so it needs the light as one of the simplest teachings of Jesus telling us that we are the light, and here's this broken, broken system um, built on sadness that is in dire need of people who love Jesus to step in in any capacity. We had talked several times about the possibility of adopting or fostering um, to uh, grow our family, uh, but that was when we made the decision, and that was two years ago. And so I think about all the, the classes that we went through and certification. Uh, they do a great job. Organizations do a great job of getting you ready to foster. Mm -hmm. You're never all the way there. But I, I think there's a misconception that you decide to foster and then someone's just dropping a, a child off at your house. And that's not what happens at all. I really like how I get to meet new people and how they can be like under the roof of our house and how we can all be together and how we can like call each other actual family. I would say if you don't get attached, then you're not doing your job. If the goal is to um, love on these kids and if you're not loving them, then you're not attached to them. So, yeah. We took in my biological cousin Isaiah when he was about three months old and he lived with us from three months until almost one year as his parents were just trying to pull their life together. Um, that didn't work out very well unfortunately and we ended up filing for custody. He lived with another family um, who kept him really safe for a year while we went through that process. And he now is permanently part of our family. So my experience with helping Isaiah in conjunction with my own history, I have a history of childhood sexual abuse. And those two things combined really drive me to be very passionate about this field of work and just trying to do everything we can to keep our kiddos safe. So I really hope that any of you who are watching this, that you'll consider, you know, whether your family is in a place to adopt. I've grown in my trust of really knowing what it means to trust God when you don't have any control over these little people who you love with everything you have. Um, and learning to love people who, who are broken and, and to sit in their brokenness with them and to find that a joy. I am a different person than I was five and a half years ago because of this foster care journey. God kind of put it on our hearts about two years ago to foster and um, so we started pursuing it. We didn't really necessarily feel ready but I don't think you ever really feel ready to foster or even to have a kid. You just kind of have to jump into it and trust that God is going to be in control and that God is going to take care of things, and he sure has. The most times I see him are in the difficult times, um, probably when we're frustrated uh, with the situation or um, with each other. Um, <laughs> we're, we're ready to give up and throw in the towel. It's when we really uh, start to see his presence and feel it the most. Um, just something just pushes us through and, and uh, allows us to just keep going. 
I think uh, one of the things that a foster parent hears all the time is, is uh, someone expressing concern that they wouldn't be able to do that because they'd get too attached to the child or, or something along those lines. Um, and, and I have all kinds of things that I think about when I, I hear that. Uh, but the first one is, is I understand, but it's also not about you and your feelings. As Christ followers, it's about how we can serve our Lord and Savior. And if that way is the foster care system for you, then, then that will overcome. God will work in you to overcome those fears of a deep sadness, um, which almost inevitably will occur. Um, so I, I, I think that in some ways people can use that as a, almost a, a false idea that would distance them from becoming involved in the foster care system when that, that is, I got to think that is the enemy telling you it's something that is, is uh, obviously surmountable in God's eyes for you and God to partner up and to overcome. After second hour, there will be pizza in the fireside room and people to talk to about the range of ways people can make a difference in the foster care system. You are needed. Whether it's through Care Portal, supporting foster and adoptive families, or opening your home to kids, everyone has a role to play. Come find out yours today. And after this service, you can go to the fireside room and Julie Getz will be there and can at least give you a handout as to ways to get involved in foster care, helping to take care of kids in our city, which there are so many ways that don't involve actually bringing a child into your home. Now, you may have interest in that. That, that would be so wonderful. But there are support, um, help, ways that we can offer that uh, just any number of things we can do to help this whole effort to reach out to kids. So see Julie after the service in the fireside room. Stick around for a couple hours and get some pizza after second service. The third group of people that Jesus has a heart for are the lost. You know, when Jesus went home with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus wasn't poor. He certainly he was quite wealthy, actually. He wasn't sick. He wasn't uh, hungry. He was lost. <laughs> he was lost. He was separated from God. And after Jesus had lunch with Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus' heart melted and he turned to God, Jesus said, this is why I came. This is exactly why I came, to seek and to save the lost. People just like Zacchaeus and so many others that don't know Jesus. And there are so many others that don't know Jesus around the world. There are groups of people around the world Almost 3 billion people around the world have no opportunity to hear of Jesus because there are no Christians who live in proximity of them. And only 3% of our missionary force are in that part of the world where those 3 billion people are, or 95% of those 3 billion people are. It's called the 1040 window. Those are measurements of latitude on the globe. And you can see on the picture where those countries and those people are are located. And Jesus said there's a harvest out there. The field, he said it's like wheat. It's, it's white under harvest. We just need people to go and to tell. And these people will respond if somebody will make that effort and love in the same way that God loves and inconvenience themselves in order to do that. And we have uh, eight of our partners, eight of our mission partners serve within the 1040 window. And four more of our partners are reaching out to people who live within the 1040 window. We have uh, people who have left Parkside to go and do mission work. Mark and Krista Haley. Mark uh, grew up here at Parkside. He and Krista are in Ethiopia now. They'll be here next week. Uh, Lori Merwin was here with us for, I don't know, 20, 25 years, and now she works with New Mission Systems International, travels the world, recruiting young adults to go into mission work. And we have others here at Parkside who are considering, right now, considering going into mission work. And Jesus saying, yes, come. Workers, that's what we need. All these people need is somebody to come and to tell. Well, within the city of Cincinnati, and I won't go into how I, how I arrived at this number, but there's about a million people, okay? About a million people in the tri-state who claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. Don't follow Christ, don't follow anybody, but they don't follow Christ. They don't know Christ. And it's, it's very clear 
in what Jesus has said, that the only sure hope we have of eternity in a relationship with God comes through Christ. So if you don't know Christ, you don't know God. You don't, we don't know God in the way we need to know Him in order to find salvation. It goes through Christ. So we, we throw out these numbers. We think, okay, three billion people worldwide. I don't know what to do about that. A million people in the tri-state. You know, our eyes roll back in our head. I just... I, I need to move on because I can't wrap my head around that. Well, what we need to do is simply if each one of us will regard the one or two or three people in our lives that we know don't know Jesus and share what we know about Jesus with them, and if they come to know him, if everybody would do that, if everybody would do that, wow, progress would be made toward a million people in the tri-state, toward, toward three billion people around the world in coming, at least having the opportunity to come to know Christ. And it really boils down to telling what you know about Jesus. We can become too intimidated thinking that we have to know systematic theology in order to explain God and explain Jesus to somebody. Those are nice things to know. They're actually good things to know. But the most powerful thing that we can share with somebody is our story. And Amy, you want to go ahead and make your way up here? Share our story, because the one thing we do know about God is, is what he has done in our lives and what Jesus has done in our lives. And it's very simple. Here was my life before Jesus. Here's what it was like. Here's how I came to know him. Here's how I became real to me, a real person in my life. And then here's what it's been like since. All of us who follow Jesus have that story. You don't have to work on it. You don't have to create it. You don't have to memorize it. It's right there. You know what it is. Now, you may want to fine-tune it, polish it a little bit, to, to be able to, to say it in an effective way to somebody. But that's what people really want to hear, and it's irrefutable. You know, you can go into systematic theology, and people go, yeah, well, I believe otherwise. But when it's your story and it's happened to you, irrefutable. And has a tremendous impact on people's lives. So this is Amy Desjardins, and I will get you a microphone here. And I've asked Amy if she would simply tell her story to you today. Um, I actually grew up in a really loving home, um, had a great childhood, had a great family, uh, really uh, had some experience with religion. We went to church once in a while, but didn't really kind of fully understand the meaning of that. And uh, I met Matt in high school. I would go to church with his family. Most of the time I would sit in the service like... I'm really hungry. When is this going to be over with? <laughs> and, you know, they're talking about sin, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm a good person, so I'm all taken care of. So, um, anyway, we, um, we were married. We were married in the church. Um, we stayed in Michigan for, um, until he finished medical school, we moved to North Carolina. And um, we were living in a small apartment on a really, really tight budget. I was staying home with uh, Ian at the time, and I was expecting Mary. And one of my girlfriends said, would you like to go to a Bible study? And I remember going to church when I was littler and, you know, memorizing all the books of the Old Testament and getting a prize at the end of that. Um, but uh, she said, I said, ah, I don't know. And she said, well, it's free child care. And I said, Okay. We were, on, we were on a really uh, don't spend anything extra kind of a plan. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So when I first walked into the church, um, I kind of felt like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not like these other people. You know, I, I kind of non-Christian printed on my forehead. Everybody can see it. Because <clears throat> I knew I knew God, but when people would talk about uh, Christian, that just seemed like something so deeper that I just didn't really understand. And... Um, so uh, we were studying the book of John. So I met some wonderful women. It was a women's Bible study. And um, always reading the Bible and the stories, it was stories. They weren't, like, alive. And um, there was something in the study that just started to kind of strike my heart. And, again, that, that's why John is my favorite book. But it was really this kind of story about how much Jesus loves us. Um, I promised Louisa I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> so anyway, this group of women just wrapped themselves around me. and We had the coolest Bible study. And they would do the neatest things, like for um, 
the story of the woman at the well. Instead, she came dressed with a cloth around her head. This was a woman named Miriam who became instrumental in my faith. Um, she was the woman at the vending machine <laughs> instead. And she came up to the vending machine, and then this you know, strange man and comes talks to her, and she shares all of her stories. And, uh, but um, I really just, just really felt loved and embraced, and there was just something about God's word that was changing me. And so um, we would occasionally go to the church services, but I really just went to the Bible study. And Matt was in residency, so a lot of times he worked on Sundays. So I was like, I was always like, oh, yeah, busy with medical school and residency. So great, I don't have to go sit through a church, long church service with him. And, uh, and um, that just kind of grew and grew. And <clears throat> these women just really built into me and just said, you know, this is what a relationship with the Lord is about. And they were just really a good example of that. And uh, I... Um, we went to church on October 31st, 1999, and the pastor was talking about communion. And I'd heard communion in a lot of different places. When we went to church with my grandmother, it was like, do not take communion if you're not Catholic or you'll be in big trouble. Um, and, uh, and I would see it pass, and I didn't really fully understand it and even like took it sometimes, but I was sitting in church and the pastor said, you don't have to be afraid to let this meal pass. This is a meal for believers, and this is a um, this is a statement of of your testimony to your relationship with the Lord. And I was like, I don't I don't want it to pass. So I took communion that day, and then after the service, we were walking out, and um, Matt had Ian on his shoulders, and and he, I just said, Hey, I became a believer today. So. Anyway, I shared it with my family and my friends, and people said, well, of course you became a believer because you were living in the Bible Belt. So, so people were like, of course, you moved to North Carolina. So, um, well, then after that, we moved to Utah, and then there were lots of um, stories about, well, once you move and get out of that environment and, you know, move back to Michigan and stuff, this is, you know, just a passing fancy. But... Um, my faith really deepened. We, had to, we, we were able to find a small church, but then I also took my son to a preschool that was at a church that, um, at that church, they did a Bible study called Disciple, and it was a 37-week study. And I developed this relationship with these wonderful, wonderful people. And um, we just did some really exceptionally um, exciting things in growing our faith together. And that's just continued to grow. And, and Matt had been so busy that he'd kind of strayed a bit from following the Lord in a lot of ways in his life as well. And since we moved here to Cincinnati, um, that's just strengthened all of our faith. So God really used me um, as well after my faith walk to, to bring him back closer to the Lord as well. And even though he had grown up the whole time in the church and he always knew that he was a believer, but just wasn't really living and breathing that every single day. So um, I have to say that, uh, you know, I had a really great childhood and it wasn't a need. It wasn't, I didn't ever feel a need. Um, and since we've become believers, we've had to overcome huge challenges of, in, in our lives of, of um, you know, personal tragedy of a death of a loved one, a death of a, a, a couple loved ones, several miscarriages, the process of adoption. And the place that we adopted from was a small Christian orphanage. And their philosophy was, if you are not a believer, it was like worse than trying to get into a college. Um, if you are not a believer, these children are better off staying where they are, where they know the, the Lord. And so if that had not been the case for me, then we wouldn't have been able to bring our kids home. So there's no doubt we've been through lots of trials, and life isn't easier because I'm a believer, but it's an incredible thing to know that you always have God to turn to, and it's never too late. And I remember those feelings of, you know, oh, I'm so sick of somebody telling me I'm a sinner. I'm so sick of hearing these sermons and all of this stuff doesn't make sense. And as long as you're good enough. Um, but Jesus, my favorite verse is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's not exclusive. It is an invitation. It is an open invitation and it's a choice. 
and it's open to anybody at any age. And uh, so I just, if you're even thinking about it, if that spark is in your heart, or you know people that are thinking about it, that it is totally worth it. It is the most beautiful eternal relationship, and it's not to be missed. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> A couple things that I <clears throat> pick up from your, your story, Amy, is first of all, you can go to church often and never come to know Jesus. <laughs> you can just go through motions that never make that connection with somebody who's real as your Savior and your Lord and the one who loves you so desperately that he would die for you. Yeah, you can, come, you can go to a lot of church services and, and that never happened, but the other thing that, there's several things that stand out, but the fact that somebody cared enough to say to you, would you come to a Bible study? And some, it's that simple often, even if we don't think we can come up with the words of, oh, how do I communicate Jesus to this person and, and so on, you can at least say, would you come with me? Would you come with me and meet my friends? I have nice friends. And obviously, this lady who invited you had nice friends, they, that you found that to be such a, a warm and loving place that it moved you to tears to even talk about it. <clears throat> it touched you. We can do that. Invite somebody to come meet your friends at Parkside, all these people who know Jesus, and it makes a wonderful difference. Uh, and so, let's, let's do that, okay? If, uh, if we each would make the effort to reach out and touch somebody that we know that doesn't know Jesus, share the story. And you think, well, how do you get into that? Well, maybe you set it up just uh, with the obvious, you know what, I want to have lunch with you, and I got something I want to tell you. <laughs> you know, make it just that awkward, and it may not be awkward at all. But pray for the opportunity. Say, God, if you give me the opportunity, I promise I'll tell the story. If you give me the opportunity, that's a dangerous prayer to pray because he will give you the opportunity. It'll come. It'll be uh, a door that's open so wide you can't miss it, and you can step through, knowing that, that God set it up. God made the appointment for you, so that's what makes it even better. It's such a, a wonderful message that we have to share that God loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his son, his one and only son. God himself became a man and came to live with us. He came to seek and to save the lost, that whoever believes in him won't perish, won't face eternity without God, but will have everlasting life. Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. These are the words of Jesus. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world could be saved through him. It's not a message of condemnation. It's not a message of telling people they're going to hell. It's a message of saying there's a God in heaven who loved you enough to die for you, and he makes all the difference in life. He makes life what it was always meant to be doesn't solve all your problems, but it's sure nice to have this great big friend in your life when you face the inevitable problems that come with living in this, in this world. So next week, here's the encouragement. I want to have you stand. We're going we're gonna to wrap it up here this morning. Here's, here's the encouragement. Bring somebody to Parkside with you next week. We're going to have 10 mission partners with us. We're going, to have, we're going to unleash them on us next week. I've told them, I said, I want you, I'm going to give you each 10 minutes. Now, this will be split between services, so you may have to stay for both services if you want to hear all 10. I said, I want you to tell us your best story. I want you to tell us the story. What is it that makes you cry? I want you to make us cry with what makes you cry and gives you passion for what you do and, and why you do what you do around the world. They'll each get their shot. You can stay for both services. We're going to take a mission offering. You can give twice next week. If you stay for both services, you can give twice to missions. What a wonderful opportunity that will be. So bring somebody here. It'll be an exciting day to hear these wonderful people, some of the best people you'll ever meet, and pouring their, their hearts out to us. Uh, second thing I want to mention before you go out the door is we've got an opportunity to do something for kids even this morning. You know, there's a display board out there. It's got blinking lights on it. You can't miss it. It's got mittens, and it's also got turkeys on it. Mittens and turkeys. Mittens are toys. Turkeys are dinners. Mittens are toys. Turkeys are dinner. And you can either get a toy to, to bring, um, buy a, a toy for a child and bring it back here so they can have a nice Christmas, or provide dinner for a family 
that isn't going to have a dinner for Christmas otherwise. Now, that doesn't mean you invite them over to your house. You could if you want to. <laughs> That'd be nice. But you buy the groceries and you deliver them to them on December the 23rd. You buy the groceries and it's all laid out on this sheet of paper right here. So I got mine. I'm going to take care of this. Meryl and I are going to take care of this family. And it's as simple as that. Go out to the display board and they'll fix you up. All right. Lots of information this morning. Let's be hearers and doers of the word today. Widows, orphans, lost people. Let's go do it. And I'm going to pray. God, I thank you for the challenge that comes with following you to know that life means something, that we can make a difference in this world, that um, our lives can impact others in such a way that they find eternal life with you and the best life possible in, in this life, and you can use us to do that, every one of us. And so I pray that we can take up the challenges here today, and each one of us will do something, something in line with what we have heard to take care of the people that you love so much. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're done.